Welcome to the AdQuick Advertising Podcast. This is episode three, where we're covering brand safety and ad fraud today. Uh, I'm Chris Gaddick, one of your hosts, joined by Adam Singer. And our special guest today is Nandini Jami, who is the co-founder of Check My Ads, an ad tech watchdog and the, one of the leading authorities in the space. Uh, welcome, Nandini. Um, to get us started, uh, in your own words, can you kind of like Tell us, you know, your short version of how you got into this space and what was the inspiration behind, you know, Check My Ads? Thanks so much for having me on the on the show, uh, uh, Chris and Adam. Um, so there, there is no real short version to how I got into this world, but I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, I was a marketing consultant working for tech companies, uh, small tech companies back in uh 2016, when the 2016 presidential elections happened. And I, uh, like everyone else, was pretty upset about the uh, the election results. And I was trying to understand what happened. And, and, and in that process, I went to Breitbart.com for the first time. Now, that website was the most influential website of, uh, of 2016. And, and some say that it helped, uh, it helped influence the, the outcome of the elections. And so when I went to this website for the first time, I was expecting to, to see a lot of incendiary and offensive headlines. But what I but what I wasn't expecting to see was ads from some of the biggest companies in the world uh, being served right in front of me. I saw ads. I think the first ad I saw was for Old Navy, and uh, and this 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 company was obviously trying to uh, had been follow, following me around the internet and served th- served its ad on Breitbart, and so. Um, so for me, that was an aha moment because I, I don't normally pay attention to ads just like everybody else, but seeing these, uh, these brands that were trying to sell to me on this website made me realize very quickly that they probably don't know where their ads are. And so I started a campaign to alert advertisers of where, of, of the fact that their ads were ending up on Breitbart and I've... I've fallen down a rabbit hole since then, and I've never come out. And so, uh, just for our audience, um, can you kind of uh, encapsulate what you what you identify or what you define as brand safety um, in the grand scheme of things? Because this is going to be a term that that keeps on coming up in the program. Oh, this is a this is a great great question um, because I have a different answer than you will find in the industry. So, um, the the way that brand safety today. Let me let me take a step back, actually, and say when we started this campaign, this original campaign to demonetize Breitbart, we we were very specific about the language we used when we reached out to advertisers. We said your ads shouldn't be funding uh, hate, hate speech, bigotry, homophobia, misogyny, uh, transphobia uh, and, and so on. And we were very specific about what it meant. We were very specific in our language because we wanted to be clear about what it is that we shouldn't fund. Now, the way that the ad industry took that work and interpreted it was that brand safety is the practice of keeping your uh, keeping your ads away from anything that could be potentially bad, sad, or controversial. Now, there's a big difference between funding hate speech and funding some bad news which is just news. Um, so the way, that, uh, the way that the ad industry, so we sort of reject the way that the ad industry defines brand safety. The way that we define brand safety is keeping your ads away from hate speech and disinformation. Mm-hmm. And additionally, it's a very key part of our definition is uh, while the ad industry defines brand safety as keeping your ads away from disinformation. We define it as keeping your ad dollars away from disinformation. And that is a very, very, um, that is a very key part of our definition. And I'll, I'll be happy to get into that. Cool. And so um, in terms of being the watchdog for this space, you know, how, what does that entail um, for, for those of us who aren't very familiar with, uh, you know, this, this up and coming, uh, con- uh, up and coming part of marketing? Uh, well, for me, it's watching a lot of uh, War Room <laughs> on three separate TVs, um, and it's also watch uh, sort of watching 
and monitoring uh, sort of ad exchange like relationships between websites and uh, and ad exchanges and kind of and kind of trying to understand who and what is involved in the supply chain and how ads are being delivered to a place like uh, to a place like Steve Bannon's War Room or to uh, any number of, of, of these other websites. So it's a very manual task for me. Right on. Uh, Adam, do you have any uh, takes that, or any questions for Nandini about, uh, you know, uh, the, the political aspect of this? Because I, I, I see you licking I, your chops around. I, so, I have so many questions. We could probably talk for like four hours on this. Um, I, I think one question that I have is, I think the, um, I, I actually think this is a case where it feels very much that when users see ads in an inappropriate spot, whether it's against hate speech, whether it's even against something like, you know, like violence or shooting. And they're like, wow, this brand is, is sponsoring this. Um, I, I think we, we see the, the clear evidence of users being like, this is not a good user experience, right? What is this brand doing here? How has your, um, how has it been actually talking to brand advertisers and what they feel? Are they, are, are they sort of understanding that they need to be user centric and, and maybe change the way they're doing this? Or are they still, you know, living in their ivory tower where it's not affecting them and they're just continuing business as usual? Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Well, yeah, I, I would actually uh, challenge the question itself, actually. Um, the, the thing that people care about that, that they've always cared about is that that an ad that that a brand's ad dollars don't fund things that are harmful to their communities and to their friends and to their families. That's always been the question, the central issue here, um, and the way that it has been co-opted by the the industry um, in 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 really um, sort of upsetting ways is is to translate this question, th translate this issue, this very specific issue, into well. Uh, into well at, c people don't want your ads on on bad sad or controversial content so there's a big difference between your ad appearing on a uh on a school shooter's manifesto versus an article from usa today covering the latest school shooting which is news which is essential and so the thing that i'm always trying to uh put forward here is that when you block your ads from uh, f from things on the internet, are you blocking the bad thing itself, or are you blocking? Uh, are you unintentionally blocking something that we all rely on and need? That's a that's a great distinction. Thank you for making that. I think that um, I think a lot of users also might not consider that. Um, I, I think some brand advertisers, um, from what I've seen, don't really like. We're talking about brand safety, but even simple things like performance, there are some brand marketers that, that don't even look at that, right? They just throw some money at their campaigns, put it online, and they're not really thinking beyond that. They're like, oh, I have this amount to spend. So it's really interesting. I'm, I'm glad that you're saying actually brands do notice a distinction and are starting to care. Is, is, is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. And I would add that that we've, we've really been pushing back against this uh, against against both the, the studies and the rhetoric around this in the ad industry. So, for example, the there's a there's an organization called the Brand Safety Institute. Um, and, and I'll be honest, I'll just be upfront here. I think they're perfectly useless. And they uh, they they. Uh, came up with a, a survey a couple of years ago. It was right actually right in the middle of the the George Floyd protests. And the survey that they put out was they had basically gone to a bunch of like people, like normal people, and asked them, "Do you think it's a good idea to put ads on uh, content related to?" And then they had this big list of of just like literal current events, like police brutality. Uh, school shootings, violence, like I think it was like climate change, like all kinds of things that are like central issues of our day. And the thing is the way that that, the, the nature of the question itself, I mean, it's not something that any of us ever think about. We don't, we don't sit around being like, oh, why did Bounce or Tide put an ad on a, on like that USA Today school shooting article? That's just like, that's invisible to it. That's not a real issue. But if you go to someone and say, what do you, what do you think? 
then you know even i would probably answer yeah i guess that seems like a bad idea so it just it it, it defies common sense you're you're going to people who have no opinion and have no stake in in any of this and um and creating an issue where it doesn't exist because nobody ever uh, called out advert. Look, we certainly never called out advertisers for putting their ads on bad news. That was never again. That was never the issue. So, so the the industry tries to confuse it, and they're they're turning it and all. You know, what is it? Twisting themselves into a pretzel to try to figure out ways to to talk about this. But really, the central the central thing that we have to stay focused on is keep your ads away from disinformation. I imagine it's not it's not helpful either when you uh, when you're running a survey and you have anchoring bias and you basically lead with all the options instead of having a free form so people can actually express their opinions. Uh, Adam, do you have anything that you'd like to add to this? Yeah, we're going to talk about big tech in just a minute, but um, I, I'm actually curious while we're still talking about brands, what percent split? is the responsibility if I am a big tech brand and, you know, I'm running ads via, you know, the GDN or whatnot. Um, what is the responsibility split? Is it mostly on tech? Is it on brand? Is it both? Like, how do you see that? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, ultimately it's in a perfect world. It's your, you know, you're the brand, it's your money. You should be aware of where your ad dollars are going, but I also recognize we live in a reality where advertisers don't have control of their ad dollars anymore. And, and when I say that, I mean, they don't know where their money is going, where their ads are going. And if they ask for that information, they will not receive it. What they will get instead from their vendors is a lot of um, just like bullshit, like uh, are you sure? Do you, do you, are you sure you need those reports? Um, is there anything else we can get you? Don't you think you have enough information? We roll this up for you specifically for your, for your convenience. Or um, if you, if you, if you keep pushing back, they'll say, well, actually we're not contractually obligated to give you that information that belongs to us. And you signed away your rights. And, uh, and if you keep asking questions, we're going to go to your boss and ask them, and let them know that you're working on issues that are outside of the scope of your job. And they do dirty things like that. We've seen them do dirty things like that to, uh, to con, uh, I don't know how you say this word, conscience, conscient people with consciences <laughs> who, uh, who, who, who have, uh, you know, read our work and, and wanted to get their hands on, on that detailed, those detailed reports that they, that they would need. Um, and then, yeah, th that's so interesting. Do you also, do you view spam similarly in terms of responsibility? Because in, in a way, like you could really group, like if, if I'm a brand, I don't want my ads running next to hate speech. I don't want them running next to spam. Like, do, do you see those as sort of like kind of grouped together, not really a different animal? By spam, do you mean content farms? Because I have a lot yeah, of- Yeah, just content farms and just overall like web scraping and, and, and not hate speech so much, but people obviously, you know, grifting in some way, shape or form and attritioning traffic through just like, you know, like um, overall just, you know, scrape sites and, and garbage, you know, may, maybe sending like some spyware and malware links as well. Because it's, it, it, it's also another part of- if you're a marketer, that's something else you need to care about. So is that something that um, you see should be viewed similarly? Yeah. So I, I view brand safety and finding your ads on a disinformation outlet as a, a window into your ad spend. You know, that's just the first uh, red flag. And usually there are more. Um, if there's If your ads are appearing on one, brand unsafe disinfo site, they're probably running on others. That's number one. And number two, you're likely wasting a whole lot of spend. Um, so uh, I'll give you, there's two things that I want to talk about. One is a couple years ago, we published a, uh, a little report that we did, a little audit that we did for a small business called headphones.com. Now they're a small business that sells high-end headphones. And we found their ads running on like epoch times or something. So we went to the CEO and said, hey, we know you care a lot about this issue, um, about disinformation. Can we can we check out your ad, uh, your ad reports? Well, he went to his ad provider, his ad partner, Critio, they're a retargeting, uh, retargeting company, and asked for 
a, a detailed report because all he had was access to a dashboard that gave him total views, total, well, what is it? Total impressions, total uh, clicks and total conversions. And that's it. But he can't see which websites are actually getting him conversions versus not. And we, so we asked for it and they said, okay, um, are you sure you need that? He's like, yes. And he got a, uh, they, they created a custom dashboard for him and sent it to him. And then we were able to look at that. So it's not something that they will give you unless you go and ask for it specifically. Um, and so we looked at it and we found, uh, we found a lot of, a, a lot of disinfo and we found a lot, a whole lot of um, websites that shouldn't be in his, like in, in, on his placement reports at all. This is yeah, a not, not contextually relevant, right? It not, yeah, not contextually relevant. That's exactly right. So we found the disinfo, we found uh, a whole bunch of uh, sort of like spammy, um, like his ads are running on a bunch of like spammy Android apps and stuff that, that his target audience is not, uh, not on. And the third thing we found was his ads appearing on a whole bunch of uh, Latin American and, and Spanish language websites, which is a geographic area that his company simply does not ship to. So we, we, we recommended that he block all of that from his, from his ad buy was like quite a lot of, <laughs> quite a lot of stuff to block. And he came back to us and told us that his ad spend had gone down from something like $1,200 a day to $50 a day. And there was no change in performance. And so, so there was like $1,150 worth of bloat or sites that, uh, yeah. that weren't in line with the, the brand or, you know, what's contextually relevant to working out for, you know, I guess if it's a higher income headphone company, you probably want to be placed uh, placed near luxury place uh, luxury placements, or definitely not Android. Android is uh, definitely not known for being the the premium brand in that space. That's right, and hey. that's just. <laughs> oh, there he is! I knew it. <laughs> that that was totally a setup, by the way. <laughs> really good. Um, no, that's that's just one example. So uh, another example is now I like this was a small business, right? And that, that, that kind of money makes a different, a, a big difference to a small business. That's the difference between able, being able to grow your team or, um, or you know, high, high value investments in your, in your marketing, your growth program. I don't have to tell you about that. But the other example that we, um, that I want to bring up is, is, is the $1 million Google site list. Now, someone, uh, someone who works in advertising sent me a, uh, sent us a list sorry, first, like kind of messed up on their on their media buy for this big brand. And they accidentally spent one million dollars of a uh, of a brand's budget without putting in all the all the normal filters and exclusions that they normally um, apply to that to that buy. And so basically uh, they had a little experiment on their hands. Where does Google send your money to when you don't when you don't when it's on the default settings? And what we found was. Um, number one is unknown. So just like millions of impressions and dollars going to, to somewhere. We don't know. Google doesn't tell us. Probably the publisher in which they have the best relationship with, uh, f best commercial relationship with, one would think. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, if, it's a, if it's a black box, right? Technically, technically what they say unknown is, is a bunch of domains that are so tiny that got so few impressions that they just bunch them all up Everyone. together. And, that makes okay. sense. So that's number one. And then number, I think number two was like Yahoo. Who uses Yahoo? Um, number five was Fox News. Then you go down and you go, oh, okay, number 18 is Breitbart. Um, I think number, I don't know, like 50 or 60 something is Zero Hedge. And then there's all these like random sites. When I say random sites, I mean those made for advertising websites, sites that exist solely to suck up your money. People don't, people don't go to zenherald.com for anything. Look it up, zenherald.com. There's a whole ring of, of websites um, owned and operated by whoever's running that site. And they, uh, they're, they're there ahead of every major national newspaper and local newspaper. I, I think you have to go down to like a thousand something before you get to USA Today. You have to go to like a couple, you know, thousand, and this was, I think this was like a, how long was this list? I think it was like 400,000 domains or something. It was, 
insane. But you don't get to anything that people read until a couple thousand. And so what does this say about where our money is going? It tells us that, A, somehow the money, I don't know how, the money is going to the least brand safe websites, the, the website that literally 4,000 advertisers said out loud, we don't want our ads on this. Google is putting it up. Google is, is Google has uh, not only prioritized it over legitimate news, they have just simply prioritized it. And, uh, and, 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 and that's for a million dollar ad spend for a company that doesn't care or give a shit about their million dollars. Now think about what that means when you apply that across all of Google's advertisers, most of whom are small businesses like headphones.com who care. Yeah, I think there was a similar exercise, although it wasn't around brand safety, but there was a, a concern. I believe this was during the recession where like Airbnb and Uber like turned off like a billion dollars worth of spend and the, the, uh, the performance was, the change in performance was negligible. Oh, the Uber one is really, really interesting because we have something to do with it. So Uber uh, in 2017, we were pressure. We as sleeping giants were pressuring Uber to uh, to block Breitbart, and they hadn't done it. And then finally, Travis went to the uh, to his head of acquisition and said, uh, "Take care of this." <laughs> and so. Uh, so they went in and they so they told all their vendors block our ads from from Breitbart and they expected that to happen. It didn't happen. The ads kept slipping through. So they then um, went in. They the, the the head of acquisition went in and paused his relationships with all of the vendors that were continuing to serve their ads on Breitbart, and braced for a huge um, or a significant fall in um, new user acquisition, and. By the way, that was a really uh, big thing to do at that time because this is like the height of the, the Uber Lyft wars. So you don't want to be doing something like this at this time. He, uh, after after a, a period of time, he realizes, huh, my ads, my acquisition hasn't gone down at all. And, and like, what's up with that? And he starts digging in to, uh, you know, auditing his ad spend and realizes that he has been defrauded out of $60 million by a single agency. And then he keeps sticking and realizes he's been defrauded out of a hundred million dollars. And um, I don't quite know what the number is now, but it was possibly um, it was it was over a hundred million dollars that he was that Uber was defrauded out of. And their spend at that time was like one hundred fifty million dollars. So unreal. We learned <laughs> two thirds of their ad spend was just burned, just burned. There's such an interesting example. There's such an interesting example because I actually wrote a post a while back about Uber in their heyday was doing things with ad targeting, which were like, no, they, they were so inappropriate and they got calls, you know, call, called out on it. They were targeting people by certain affiliations in Facebook that any marketer with a brain would have known not to do that. And so I wrote a post about, you know, growth hacking for, you know, metrics for the sake of metrics is, could ultimately cause a PR nightmare if you're doing things where the optics are bad. So, you know, my sense, and you can tell me, you know, what do you think about this, is the notion of this just like purely, um, purely sort of numbers-driven hyper-capitalist marketing where you're only looking at dashboards yeah. is ultimately going to get you into trouble. You need the human aspect of marketing. You do. By the way, nobody even got into trouble. No one. So uh, the, 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 the head of acquisition, Kevin, he was like, he's gone on a different podcast. And he was like, he's like, I went into work and I was like, guys, we've been defrauded out of $100 million. And, and nobody gave a shit. They're like, okay, it's not their money. They don't care. It, it, it was, in, it, it's unbelievable the amount of money that are just being we don't know where it's going. And I, maybe you don't care what if Uber is wasting its money. And I don't, I personally don't. But what I do care about is the fact that Uber is sending money to who, who are the people that were on the other end of that, of the other end of those transactions. And if you are a marketer listening to this, um, you bring up a great point. When you are auditing your ad spends online, if some metrics look fuzzy, really bad, faked, 
in my experience, um, you can flag those that spend as spam, bot traffic. And in most cases, you actually will get a refund by Facebook and Google and Twitter. Um, smaller ad networks, good luck. You know, this is sort of a separate thing than necessarily um, being alongside content you wouldn't want to be. This is more alongside, you know, maybe you were just put on really bad scraper sites or maybe nowhere at all, right? Maybe there was a bug or something and those ads weren't run and, you know, your metrics got inflated. Um, I would definitely keep a close eye on um, your your numbers. So can, can you talk a little bit about if I am um, a brand and a startup, how do I actually work with Check My Ad since you're not an agency and a consultancy? Yeah, um, you... <laughs> Well, we don't. Yeah. So we don't work with clients. Um, what we do now is primarily we investigate the supply chain and we uh, we write about it and we advocate. So the way that we operate now is is a little bit of uh, of, of, of what you saw with Sleeping Giants. So we have uh, we've we've grown a, uh, a a community once again of people who care and who want to um, to do something other than vote every two years. Um, and we give them the op so we we sort of educate them on the ad on the ad tech industry, which isn't the the, the most fun or the most sexy, uh, but we do it uh, we do it through um, through these storylines of how an ad network or an ad exchange that you've never heard of is working with Bannon, um, and then what we do is we give them email addresses of executives at these companies, and we say. Uh, and we give them a template and we say, reach out to them, reach out to them yourself and, and, and ask them why they're doing this. And it's not, and this is not just, uh, this is not just our, it's not just our, our personal opinion that this ad exchange shouldn't be working with Bannon. This is, this is against their own policy in their, uh, in their brand safety agreements, in their uh, supply policies to be specific around um, who they will and will not monetize. So um, I look at their prohibited content and every, every ad exchange, every major ad exchange has a, a list, including Google, of content that they prohibit from monetization. And that language has become increasingly specific over time thanks to our work because advertisers have been making uh, more specific demands of what they think should or should not be, um, is not appropriate for monetization. I'll give you an example. There's an ad network called Playwire that in their supply policy says, we, we don't monetize content uh, that, that advocates the overthrow of the government. And get this, we found them monetizing Charlie Kirk. <laughs> <laughs> so we just go directly to them and say, you are violating your own standards. You, like, is that something your clients would be okay with? And of course it's, it's not. So, so they act very quickly. So it seems like, uh, just to kind of paraphrase, uh, not a whole lot has been done in this space. What protect outside of the the afterthought? Oh crap! This is might be adversely affecting us. What are some of the hands-on keyboard protections that uh, maybe that some of the tech providers have enabled, if any? Well, I can tell you all the tech providers that aren't doing anything about this, and it would just be me handing you that crazy map of a thousand million. Ad tech company. <laughs> what is that? I mean, I mean, we we get we have brand safety as a concern in out of home in you right. know, outdoor advertising. Uh, before the internet, you were you would solve that by going on a market ride with the salesperson, seeing if your advertisement is uh, in the neighborhood uh, that is that aligns with you know your your target demographic, so on and so forth. And now in the, you know uh, in, the, in 2023, we do that you know through Google Street Views, or we're able to see a given locale. Based on that. So what you're saying is there's there's like you still can't go in and be like, I don't want to be on this site. I don't want to be on this site. No, uh, no. I think what you're asking me is how are ad tech companies and or the brand safety industry uh, tackling this issue? And I can uh, I can sum that up by saying inefficiently. So what they do is um, so. You might be familiar with brand safety companies like Integral Ad Science and Double Verify, Comscore, Oracle. Yep. Um, they're all shit, and I'll tell you exactly <laughs> why. I'll tell you exactly why, because uh, 
they use, they all use, they all have some variation of, of this thing called contextual intelligence. And that contextual intelligence is when they scan a page for, um, to understand what the page is about. So they're, they're like, we can read the page just like a person would. And we'll be able to tell you what the, we're able to know instantly what the, the, the topic is and um, whether it's, 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 it's a positive sentiment topic or a, a negative or neutral or whatever. Okay, so uh, how does it work? They won't tell us, except this one time when the, uh, what is it, integral ad science slipped up. So a couple years ago, they put out this tool for about uh, 24 hours or less. Um, they put out a tool, the, a sort of like a demo of, of the product. And of course, like I was on it. And, uh, and, I, uh, and I put in a white nationalist website. Uh, so like, uh, I think it was like American Renaissance, Amaran, Am like clear white nationalist website mm -hmm. um, to see how they would rate. So like rate various types of sites. So Amaran was rated as a neutral. And uh, under the topics, it was, um, they like, they saw like they had highlighted the words, you know, white and politics and stuff like that, but like they missed white genocide. <laughs> um, so, so that was rated overall neutral and that would have, you know, a lot of advertisers, you know, are fine with having their ads on neutral content. Um, I also looked up interestingly, a, uh, I, I was really curious about this because of the way that this technology works is, you know, even an algorithm, an algorithm is going to be based on what you input into it, right? And a lot of advertisers in these ad exchanges have put words like lesbian and death on their on their uh, brand unsafe keyword block list. So I was like, well, how would the algorithm handle that? So I looked up a um, so on Refinery Twenty Nine. There's a there's an article about something called lesbian bed death, which is <laughs> which is a real um, thing, and it's like a it's like a scientific term, but it has two bad words in it. So um, I put that in and it, it was, um, it was marked as brand unsafe. And then I put in, I think, who was that? Like that gun girl, that girl who like from Ohio, who like carries the gun around with her all day. I put that in and that was, um, that was either neutral or positive I'm forgetting. But then I put in, uh, Kenosha, like, a, a, a an article from a local Kenosha, where um, Rittenhouse was right, the the, the yeah, shooter. So in the middle of all this, and so I put that in, and that was just like blanket negative. So what I was finding was that it wasn't identifying white nationalist rhetoric and and un, like these brand unsafe websites, but it was, um, but it was like essentially blocking ads from, uh, from like safe <laughs> like safe news sources. Um, and yeah, and they and they took that tool down and they, they never put it out again for a good reason. Um, another now another uh, sort of data point that we have is uh, a couple years ago, uh, a researcher that we collaborate with, Dr. Christoph Fran, is that came to us and said, hey, I think I have found a bunch of uh, brand safety values uh, lying around on the, the, the Internet. I found it like in my browser. <laughs> And so, um, and this was also from Integral Ad Science. And we found, uh, well, Chris, Christoph found um, some very interesting data. According, like in a nutshell, what he found was that uh, Integral Ad Science is, is unable to tell the difference between crime, like crime, and the coverage of crime. So like actual crimes, they don't find it, but the coverage of crimes they do. So what was happening, for example, was they were they were marking um, over 90% of articles written by the crime novel uh, reviewer at the New York Times as brand unsafe. They were marking the ent basically entire beats of crime reporters as brand unsafe. So no top level domain exclusions or anything like that. No. Right. You you would reasonably infer that you'd just be like, okay, this is a publisher that covers this beat. Okay. No, they don't do top level domains because they don't make money by doing top level domains, do they? They make money by doing the stupid, like running their stupid algorithm on every impression. So they don't do that. And that hurts everyone. So they they not only uh they not only disproportionately harm legitimate news organizations we found that they were they were um they were allowing ads on websites like hannity.com at higher uh at higher rates than than legitimate brand safe news sources and so this is this is this is the thing you have to be afraid of because 
they not only don't work, but they don't want you to see how it works. So they won't tell you. You can't go, even if you're a client, even if you're spending millions of dollars with integral ad signs or double verify, if you go and you ask, tell me which URLs you've blocked my ads from, they will not tell you because that would, would unravel the whole thing. Now, can I add what the real problem is? The real problem, while they do all this shit with the, the millions of, you know, the millions of dollars that you're spending on scanning these stupid websites, the real problem is that your domain block lists don't work and, and the stupid scanning stuff doesn't work because the bad guys already know not to use those, those words because they're not freaking journalists. They don't care. They're not trying to be accurate. They're just trying to make money. So they have found ways to evade these technologies, which are not very smart to begin with. And the second thing that they've done is they, it doesn't matter if you've blocked their stupid domain because they're operating on a different level. And that level is seller accounts. So, um, for, so real quick, a seller account is is required for any website that mo like that monetizes. Like, you need to obtain a seller account with an ad exchange to be able to start like accepting ads because they need to know who you are and they need to have a bank account for you. So, um, so if you have if you obtain a seller account, so let's say Breitbart.com obtains uh, a seller account. And then everyone blocks Breitbart.com. Well, their seller account is still active. So they can just spin up a new website and then mm -hmm. continue to make money. And let me tell you, that's exactly what they're doing. So I'll give you an example. There's a, there's a, there's a website called thepostmillennial.com, which is extremely brand unsafe. Um, they, they employ multiple white nationalists. They employ Andy No. Um, uh, they, they just like, they employ straight up fascists. And... Uh, and they, if, if you look under their seller accounts, you'll notice that they also run, in addition to the post-millennial, a website called wocanada.ca. And wocanada.ca is a great place for you to, um, to find the five top donut shops in, for your next visit to Quebec City or five great hikes in Ontario. It's literally a content farm. Best, so best, best poutine in Montreal. Exactly. They are running a, 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 a brand safe operation to subsidize their brand unsafe operation. And this is just one example. This is what is happening across the industry. And none, none, of, these, none, of, none of these brand safety technology companies even acknowledge that it's happening. Do you, do you think they don't acknowledge it because it's too hard of a problem and they, they don't care or is it just not a priority? I'm curious because it seems like it's, it would be pretty universally supported to not, you know, to, to want your product to not be on, you know, a white nationalist website. Like that doesn't seem controversial. Well, they, of course they don't want to find this problem because if they find the problem, they make less money. So that, that makes sense. <laughs> like sadly, we're the only nonprofit in this industry. We're not here to make money. So we, we don't, you know, we, we don't take money from ad tech companies. So, and we're not, we're not here to make a, a profit. We're just here to solve the problem. And so if you're really here to solve the problem, if you're serious about it, you're not going to be scanning stupid websites. You're going to be digging into the financial ties and the financial ties are happening under, under uh, the radar. And you're not going to find them by looking at keywords because they're not using those anymore. You have these people who are running uh, content farms that, by the way, are not, the, these seller accounts are not linked for the most part, especially for, for Google, this is another issue. Seller accounts should tell you what company uh, a website is associated with. That's the point of a seller account. So advertisers can look at the seller account and go, okay, that belongs to the New York Times company. But what Google has done or not done is they have not released the, the identities of something like 90% of these seller accounts. So if you go to most of these content farms and you try to look at the ownership, the ownership data, you won't find anything. So you don't know who that website, that content farm belongs to. So what does that mean? Where is your money going? If you're, if, so it's like, it might be just like some like Hollywood gossip website. It might look harmless, but who is running it? Because whoever is running it is making a lot of money because you haven't blocked that website because you don't think it's a big deal. It's just like dumb crap and gossip. Totally. And this is happening at scale. Google is a $250 uh, billion dollar, um, ad advertising business. I mean, and, and they are just 
wh where is the money going? The money could be going right now. Right now, the money could be going to fund the Kremlin because we, we, we can't audit the spend. It could be funding disinformation operations here domestically because we, we can't audit it. So what we've done as advertisers is we've given up entirely our control over our ads and our media budgets. And we are funding all the things that we say we don't want to fund. And we have no way to stop it. I, I think another great point that you made as you were talking is, you know, the opportunity cost, like, I don't think anyone, whether you're, you don't have to be an advertiser to not want money going to things that are sowing distrust in our country or promoting hate speech. And every one of those dollars is a dollar that could be going to your favorite creator, you know, whether it's political or not, you know, that's, that's money that could be going to fund the people that, you know, are earnestly making a living online, promoting, you know, things that are, you know, generally accepted by the world and, you know, are positive things for everyone. So I think that's probably another, an, another way to frame it for any creator listening, you know, you should be vocal about this because this affects you and, you know, all of your peers. Exactly. Headphones.com with the kind of money that they were wasting every day could have been giving out a headphone a day to, to their, to their fans, to influencers, to content creators. They could have been hiring people. They could have been they could literally be giving away money to to communities. They could be doing all kinds of creative things that would actually make people pay attention. But instead, they but when you make this decision to invest your money into program into the programmatic advertising ecosystem, you're making a commitment to to what to to nothing. Yeah. Um, this has been really fascinating on the uh, side of brands. Um, and and ecosystems and programmatic, which I think you've given everyone really good food for thought to chew on. I wanted to ask another question that wasn't about programmatic, but I know you're going to have great opinions on this. And I think that this is a, a really interesting one right now. Um, so, you know, everyone, ha every conversation has become politicized, whether, you know, you're going like super far right or super far left or whatever. People are using it to score points for social media engagement and whatnot. And me, a marketer, I, I've been watching brands surprisingly like do things to align with, you know, the right and like crazy things or um, whatnot. Um, so if I am a brand and I'm this boring product, it, 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 it seems tempting for a lot of these marketers to, to want to align politically, which to me seems weird, right? Like I don't, like why, like, why are you trying to align this CPG good? Or if you're, you know, Disney World, why are, why are your executives like publicly like endorsing, you know, something where I'm like, wait a minute, what are, they, what are they saying? So, but it seems like that's kind of either exciting for some people or they're just these executives that are really bored to say things. What are your thoughts on sort of just brands taking sides politically or or pushing on political thumbnails for marketing or awareness i'm, I'm curious what you think of that it, it seems kind of crazy to me but I, i'm curious your thoughts as someone who's not like in the space every day yeah that's a that's a great observation and i would say the answers lie in the 2020 edelman trust barometer survey results which found that consumers through through just in general like just things that have been happening over the past few years plus the pandemic are looking to connect with brands in authentic ways and that is uh, that is in ways that enrich their pers their their personal lives their communities their their networks their families and so on so what people are looking for you as a brand to do is to contribute to, to make a positive impact in their lives. And so what that means for you as a brand isn't, isn't I, I don't think it's a political question. I think it's a question of how can we use the budgets that we have to, um, to connect in a way that isn't flashing a stupid ad in front of them, but meaningfully um, improving their lives. And there are, I mean, like I said, you could be headphones.com giving away a headphone a day, um, a, pair, a pair of headphones a day. You could be, and I think there was also this, this website called didtheyhelp.com that popped up during the pandemic. 
uh, logging which companies were uh, using their resources to help people um, in the pandemic. So like, so like the beer companies that started making hand, hand sanitizer and stuff like that. And, and that's what people are looking at. And so that is a really exciting question, I think, for marketers to, um, to evaluate in, with regards to whatever it is that they sell. And it, it gives you the opportunity to be um, creative and innovative. And, and God knows we need more of that in this industry. Do you think, though, that the, the, the razor's edge to that is then you also get brands like my pillow who are basically going to full on troll and and support like the crazy side because they know they know that that base will then be like oh this is like you know I, i'm supporting like you know i'm part of this tribe so it it, it seems like you kind of get both which, which i mean i my pillow i don't think i don't think he's doing that good i mean he spends a lot he spent a lot of money on advertising and then saturated that audience and the product sucks my old man bought one off of fox news <laughs> <laughs> I, don't think, yeah, I don't think it's a very good product. And um, by the way, he lost like all of his uh, distribution centers. Everyone dropped him after he supported the insurrection. Um, no, don't take your cues from my pillow. Take your cues from uh, from the past. I mean, in the past, we thought about mar as marketers, we thought of ourselves as, as stewards of our brand. How do we make decisions that contribute to the longevity of our brand? How do we make people feel warm and fuzzy when uh, when they think about us? That's what made Coca-Cola a great and lasting brand. Um, and today we are thinking in terms of incrementality. We are thinking in terms of um, how to meet a bunch of, um, frankly, vanity metrics. And we are not only suffering in our own profession, but we are not adding value to the people we say we want to connect with. And so. Yeah. Oh, so I was going to say, uh, I was going to say, um, thank God, because, you know, there's this fear scenario in my head where every brand becomes far left or far right. And it's becomes kind of like the Twitter of you know, the Twitterization or the streamification of everything and becomes really bipolar. So I'm glad that that fear is um, over concerned on. So, so on, on the right, we sort of have the, you know, brands trying to be my pillow or sell crazy mugs and rounding error stuff. But what's interesting, and, and I think to your point about authenticity, we also see brands pandering on the left, like the Pepsi one where the woman, like the cop hands someone a Pepsi. And that one was clearly not yeah. real or right there. Oh, I think the, we have this, we have, we're, the hard wired. we're hardwired to tell if it's real or not. And that's, I think why people were like, what are they doing? Right. Exactly. And like, yeah, these are, the, these are some hard questions. And where, from where I sit here at, you know, check my ads HQ. Um, my, my thing is that I, I, I think that you can make such a, wildly um wildly significant impact on the world simply by checking your ads and you will hear these uh these uh steve bannons and dan bonginos talking about us and saying uh, all kinds of uh making up all kinds of claims about us but at the end of the day we are calling for a very unsexy thing and that is advertising transparency we just want advertisers to be able to and to actually take the steps of checking their ads because that sim that one simple act will help you help us take on the disinformation economy and it won't just help and i don't know if you care about the disinformation economy um maybe that's not the thing you care about but then uh it'll definitely help you save money it'll it'll definitely help you improve your um, your business de decisions. It'll help you save money. It'll help you give somebody a raise or I don't know what you want to do with that money. And, and, and so I have a simple message. It is literally the, the title of my company. Check my, check my ads, check your ads. Yeah. I love it. And, and I love that, you know, I think the best among us who are, you know, career marketers and this is their living and they live and breathe it and they love media. Those are the people who are, you know, they've always been, very thoughtful of where ads are spending. I think um, it, that message, like when you're talking about, even if you only cared about money, it is in your interest on spending on, you know, high quality sites that reach real users, not 
you know, the, the, the type of people that are visiting those sites who aren't going to be great customers anyway. Right. So, um, I, I think the message is right. And, um, you know, I, I don't think anything with what check my ads is doing is uncontroversial. I just think you're such a firebrand online. I had to ask like your thoughts on what some of these companies are doing. Cause I think a lot of brand marketers like brand safety and, and, um, all of that and spam aside, I think a lot of them are sort of lost in the current landscape of, of what to do. Right. And, you know, the three TV channel world is blown up. Cable's going away. You know, their internet ads aren't so effective. People care more about organic content. Like, what do you like for a lot of these people, they don't know what to do. Yeah. Yeah, I I, I sympathize. And, and, and that's why I say become a, become a marketing steward. Um, I, I think like the word stewardship, I think is, is, is really uh, is really powerful because it, it reminds us that we we own our brands and every decision that we make uh, about our brands, the way that it shows up in the world, is 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 on us, not and not on some third party company. We've we've almost forgotten what it's what it's like because we we gave up our advertising, our most important uh, our most important decision, the way that we show up in the world to somebody else. And I want to see marketers take back that power to remind themselves that the responsibility is, is ultimately on us. I love it. Chris just wrote an op-ed in Fast Company that says exactly what you just said. So really? I think I think in the out-of-home space, we see the same things that you're seeing when you dig into um, programmatic ad networks online where, you know, we're... We're obviously in real life space. Like you see your ad in the exact you know space that you bought it. You paid for that space in that time and it's right there. And so we're actually doing something else where we're bringing internet metrics and just like dashboards and analytics around physical world ads. But it's, it's one, of the, one of the thesis that we have with this company isn't just about in real life accountability. It's that there is a bubble in the online ad space. And a lot of those ads aren't effective, aren't seen, are on low quality sites or sites, as you note, shouldn't have the ads from brands at all, right? And given the limitations that we've covered in the past, you know, what 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 are some of the, these up and coming channels that you've identified as being a little bit more safer for advertisers to, to kind of go after? One immediately that comes to mind is podcasting, right? You get the... Mm-hmm. Well, uh, although although there are, uh, there are <laughs> companies making inroads into programmatic uh, podcasting, but maybe you could touch on that a little bit. Then. I regret to inform you there's there's no safe place to advertise right now. Twitter went to shit. Uh, Ooh, that's fun. Well, should we talk about that? <laughs> I was I was going to ask her about Elon, but let her talk about. <laughs> uh oh. Yeah. Um. I think I, I think one of the more interesting things that we haven't talked about as as marketers is that on our watch, the entire in- internet went to shit, right? Like we have only ourselves to blame that Twitter was a- the cesspool that it was. We did not do enough as advertisers to push back against the way that Twitter is. And they would have if, uh, you know, they would have made different decisions if advertisers were, um, were, were fully leveraging their power. The same with Facebook. The same with, I think pretty much, Anything. I mean, we only have ourselves to blame that we have just like, there is no place today that you can advertise open web. There's no, um, on the open web on, on these walled social media platforms. Um, there is no ad exchange that I can recommend to you. There is no social media platform that I can recommend to you. And, um, I mean, that, that's the reality of where we are. Like, I, th- I think that advertisers are really just kind of like taking a step back and be like, we don't know where to advertise anymore. Um, don't even bother with streaming TV, you guys. Streaming TV is a huge mess. I mean, I, I admit I don't watch TV that much, but I, um, and I, and I learn as I go, by the way, I'm like, I'm like not, I don't know everything about advertising. I, there's mm-hmm. so much I don't know. But um, like two years ago, I, I, I thought I took care of War Room because uh, I was watching War Room on my computer and I saw ads for GoDaddy and then uh, notified everybody. And I was like, oh, okay, they're gone now. So he's not making money anymore. And I didn't pay attention. What I didn't realize is that War Room sits in a, uh, it sits on a channel, it's, it's hosted by a channel called Real America's Voice, which is owned by another company called Performance One Media, LLC. Performance One Media, LLC, also owns a company called 
weather, an outlet called Weather Nation, which is 24 uh, seven streaming weather. And what I learned by watching, what I learned by watching, um, what I learned by watching TV, look, I had a Roku TV. Now I have two more TV, I have an LG and I have a Samsung as well. I learned that the biggest advertisers in the world were advertising on um, were advertising on Real America's Voice because they did not realize the difference. Because I I believe what happened, and based on my research, this is probably true, that these advertisers believed that they were advertising with a with some like normal company because performance one media sounds normal. Yeah. Um, they thought they were advertising on Weather Nation, but where their ads are really ending up was on War Room, and so. Uh, for the past, I don't know, a few years. Per, uh, per, and oh yeah, and the other thing about the other thing about Performance One Media is they're the ones that had all the relationships with uh, with the all the all the the the, the mediums and the manufacturers. So so they have um, they got Real America's Voice into Roku, into Samsung, into um, Direct TV, and Amazon, uh, Amazon Prime, whatever, like all those places because of Performance One Media LLC. And so all these major advertisers, Audi, BMW, Etsy, Hilton, uh, IAMS, the pet food company, all of them found their ads running on War Room. And they have no, they don't know, by the way, they don't know to this day, I believe they don't know how the ads ended up there because, because CTV is such a hot mess. It is the new wild west. And so every time we try to take care of something like the, the open web, they all move to the next thing and to the next thing. And so those two next things right now are, um, are CTV and podcasts. Have you thought about putting together like, say a list of like having a resource on your site where here's a list of newsletters, here's a list of TikTok users, here's a list of, you know, YouTube channels as like guides for, you know, different brands. Like it feels like, it, you know, I, I'm not saying you have to like be like advisory so much, but um, I, I, that could be like a cool resource. I don't know. I was just thinking as you were talking because it's like, it. it I, I think what you're scratching at is that, um, this problem is not going to get solved with new formats of media where there's like this going to be this infinite tail of, you know, unmanageable amount of content and channels. And there's not really much motivation on the um, on the actual tech platform side. So it could be kind of cool. Like if I were like a small business and I could be like, oh, here's a list of, you know, real things I could I could advertise with. Yeah. Um... Well, actually, I, I'll turn that around to to your audience. Uh, we are we are starting to build out resources, more proactive resources for uh, marketers. We we hope to have a, a hub where marketers can come and sort of understand more about the ad tech industry and the things that they should be asking their vendors and know about vendors before signing contracts and so on. Um, we don't do. Uh, we don't do lists. So the, the most frequently asked question that I have had since running Sleeping Giants was, um, can you give me a block list? And the answer is no, because if I gave you a block list, you would apply that block list and then you wouldn't do any of the work on your own. And you need to do the work because this is, uh, because what's happening again is no, there's, an, first of all, there's no way for me or anyone with all the resources in the world to uh, maintain a block list because Google invites, I don't know how many thousands and hundreds of thousands of websites into their inventory every day, every week. So we can't keep up with that kind of thing. So that's why we need advertisers to be following us, little plug for us, mm -hmm. to understand what the techniques are that are um, that are allowing the bad actors to continue to operate. And what we will do is we will keep you posted on our investigations. We'll keep you posted on the seller accounts that we, um, we are having ad exchanges drop. And we are hoping that advertisers will join us because ultimately we work on, we work in the interests of advertisers who work in the interests we hope of their own customers and audiences. And uh, we want you to, uh, to be your, we want 
you to be able to be your own advocate in the ad tech industry. I love that message. And I think um, education is exactly the right approach to get uh, particularly um, young and new to the industry advertisers aware of the power they have. And I think that, you know, getting them to be really passionate about it and, you know, giving a, giving a F about um, the impact of where they're spending their dollars, right? You know, we live in a capitalist society, everyone's voting with their dollars. And so I think the more you can get people to care, they're going to get to the, to, to the right endpoints of what they should be doing. I think it becomes pretty obvious to, to any advertiser. If you look at, um, you know, whether, whether it's a hate speech site or a spam site, like you don't want your ad there. It's like, you know, and I think shining the light starts with maybe some of the marketers who are just throwing cash at, you know, whoever, because they feel like they have to tick a box. But I think if you can educate more people to care, they're going to do a better job. They're, they're going to have better results. And ultimately we get a better world, right? Absolutely. And my only request to your audience today is, I would love to get my hands on your ad placement reports. And I would love to have that because one of the initiatives that, um, that we would like to, uh, to introduce is, is, is audits. Um, so if you are interested in an off the record or maybe on the record audit of your ad spend, please contact me and, <laughs> and we'll, we'll make it happen. Awesome. I, I just had one more question I want to go through because yeah. it's top of everyone's mind. And um, what are your thoughts on our beloved community of Twitter? Because we all mm -hmm. love Twitter. It's such a great site. Um, I don't want to see anyone taking it the wrong way. I want to see, you know, th the community ultimately coming to power. We know each other because of it. We've been here before anyone was sort of trying to play Game of Thrones and put, you know, put their egos on things. So what do you think happens next in terms of, um, do, do, you know, Elon's ownership? Do you see advertisers sticking around, yeah. not caring? Do you see him selling? I'm curious, just your take, however you want to comment. Sure. So my, uh, so when this whole thing happened, people asked me if we would do, we would be doing some kind of an advertiser boycott. Um, and I said, no, I don't think that's worth our time because we already did the work. Let me tell you the, all of those, those organizations like GARM, the Global Alliance for Responsible Media, which represents, um, a part of the World Feder Federation of Advertisers, which represents, I don't know, like some billion dollar amount of, of money, um, and the biggest brands in the, the, the world. Um, they have, their little framework and other things because and, and, and definitions of what brand safety is and all the work that they have done to this point is because of the work that Sleeping Giants did. Am I still online? You are still online. It went super quiet for okay. So <laughs> let me just I was I was like <laughs> okay let me, just, let me just start that over. We're still here. <laughs> Um, no, so so the thing that let me just back up a little bit. So the reason that we don't want the reason that I felt like it wasn't a good use of our time, that I don't feel like it's a good use of our time to 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 target Twitter the way that you know we've we've done with platforms and exchanges in the past is because th he's just kind of doing the work uh, himself. <laughs> <laughs> He's yeah. the most active boycotter of Twitter that I have ever seen. And, uh, and and the work has been done. So the definitions of brand safety exist. There, there's frameworks that exist and that they exist because of, uh, of the work, the groundwork that Sleeping Giants and, um, and other sister efforts have already done in the past. So we already laid the groundwork for advertisers to leave because they all signed on to these agreements, to these uh, these charters and, and, and so on. So, so they had no choice. A lot of advertisers had no choice but to leave basically, unless they wanna look like hypocrites and, and create a lot more issues for themselves down the line. So the, the work has been done. The advertisers have left. Um, there is no chance for growth. Or there's no pathway to growth for for um, an Elon-run Twitter. So I don't feel like it's a it's a good use of our time. 
to beat a dead horse. I'm really sad for what this means for Twitter, of course. I mean, I've, I've met so many amazing people and of course, all the work that we've done has been on Twitter, but um, but th that's the nature of of uh, of marketing for you. I mean, things change, people change, people move on, and we have to adapt to uh, to new realities to be able to connect with people in other ways. So while I think it sucks and I'm really sad about it, I'm kind of excited to be you know experimenting with new ways to 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 reconnect and and grow my audience again. Cool. Well. Thank you for your thoughts. Um, no one is unopinionated on questions about Elon Musk. So I, I love it. Um, I think everyone should have opinions, you know. Um, and yeah, this has been so great to talk. I think that our sector benefits so much by having people who genuinely care about advertising. I think you're someone when you do see a great ad and you find a great brand, whether it's a Shark Tank mom and pop startup or like a brand we grew up with, like, I, I don't know about you, but I, I, I like it. I think like advertising is very American. It's it's part of our DNA. You go into a city like New York Times Square wouldn't be the same thing without without ads, right? So um, I think the more we, we all care about the quality of our ads, um, the better our industry and the better our worlds will be. Um, is there anything else that you want to close with? Nandini, yeah. where, 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 can, where can our audience find you? How can they connect with yeah. you? Uh, this Plug away. <laughs> uh, thanks for asking. You can, um, what I would like to plug is Branded, our newsletter where we publish the investigations that the ad tech industry doesn't want you to know about. It's where we uncover new stories and push the industry forward. Pretty much every brand that we've written has resulted in uh, some tangible industry-wide change. So if you could, please go to checkmyads.org slash branded and sign up for our newsletters we will not spam you. We'll just send you the, the newsletters as we, uh, the investigations as we put them out. Um, and follow us on, uh, I guess, Twitter. Um, I'm at Nan Doodles, and we are also at Check My Ads HQ. Uh, I don't know how, how much longer you can do that. So I guess do it while you can. Cool. Um, thank you. Um, and like every self respecting, uh, aspiring, podcaster i should say we'll add them in the show notes and we'll drop the links to make it easy for the audience yeah you really? like that adam i'm, I'm getting, yeah, pre getting, pre getting pretty good at this it's, it's um, like we're you're a proper podcast marketer right we're we're in new ground here <laughs> yeah um again well, thank you for your time nandini uh we were we're so blessed to have uh, your uh, your your expertise and uh hear your takes on on this space uh i imagine that we're just starting to scratch the surface on brand safety and ad fraud, especially with like generative AI. But I think that's a conversation for another, another episode, perhaps in the future. <laughs> um, Adam, is there anything that you'd like to add before we wrap up here? No, um, it's awesome to talk with ad tech industry pioneers. So um, this has been really fun. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. And then everybody, if you've enjoyed what you've heard today, uh, smash the subscribe button, leave us some comments, uh, leave us some reviews, tell us what we can improve, what we shouldn't improve. Uh, we'd greatly appreciate it. Again, uh, this is Adam, Nandini, and Chris, the AdQuick Advertising Podcast, Episode 3, and that's a wrap.